Hello, everybody. Happy Monday and welcome. Today is the 109th episode of Let's Do Lunch. Um, and it is also our last um, business of streaming episode of the season. We'll be returning again in 2021. Um, but we've had quite a run. I think uh, th we've done close to 30 episodes of, uh, of business of streaming since we started back in March. And we have another fantastic one for you uh, today to wrap up our season. Before we get to that, let me remind you that we have our chat open on the bottom nav um, and we welcome introductions. So please introduce yourself in the chat. When you do, make sure to change the drop down from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. Um, also, um, you can post questions for the panel in the Q&A button, which is just to the left of the chat. So please put the questions there so that it's easy for our panelists and moderator to see them. Um, so as, as, as with every Monday, we have the wonderful Colin Dixon with us. Colin, how are you? I'm doing well, Ned, and uh, I'm kind of really sad that this is the last one that we'll be doing for a while. I've really enjoyed doing them with you and, and the Digital Media Wire. Well, we will come back uh, energized and excited for 2021. I look forward to chatting with you about how we're going to come out of the, the pocket for 2021 as well. So Fantastic, fantastic. Yep. And I'll be here because, I'm, uh, as I yeah. say, it's been, it's been a lot of pleasure. But... Yeah. Boy, we are finishing with a bang, Ned, because we have the third and final episode of The Psychology of the Consumer. This time we are focusing on churn. We've gone through the complete cycle. We started at the beginning with, with recruiting people and the feelings there. Then it was growth in the middle. And now we're doing churn. Um, so uh, it's going to be a gr another great session. Um, I want to remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat window, although we will be bringing the chat into things towards the end, and I'll tell you more about that in just a okay. second. Hey, don't forget to introduce yourself there, as Ned said, in the chat window, but please put your questions in the Q&A, and I'll try and include them as we go. And that said, let's get going. So I'd like to introduce once again, Bavesh Vagalia. He's CEO of Singular Decisions. Bavesh, welcome back for number three. Hello, Colin. Welcome. How are you doing? And uh, we also have Jennifer Whitaker. She's qualitative, qualitative researcher and director at Quali Project. Jennifer, back again in your comfy seat. Yes. Hi, Colin. <laughs> and we have Katerina Wittgens, who is uh, business psychologist and researcher with us from Germany. Welcome, Katharina. Good evening. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so we are all four assembled once more. So um, before we get started, I think um, we should probably talk about how um, uh, one of the, I think one of the themes that we're going to talk about today is how SVOD providers are really in a way culpable. They're really, it's their fault that a lot of people churn out. Um, and we're gonna talk about the, how the, the relationship dynamics, they're really misaligned. And we'll look at how providers can create an environment that reduces that churn uh, and how to ensure cancel customers, if they decide to leave, actually come back. So let's, let's, get, let's get started. And Bavesh, I wanted to bring you in. Um, maybe you could sort of set the scene here for us. We've uh, we've talked a lot in the past about relationships in the last couple of se sessions about relationships. Um, so so bring us up to speed to how we got how we got to the churn part. Yeah, Colin. So yeah, so as you said, it's the third one. This one's on on churn. But we started this what well, I guess uh, almost two three months ago, where we were looking to do some research to really understand. Um, the emotional and psychological drivers that all of us have, right, as consumers, human beings, as we interact with OTT services. And we wanted to delve a little bit deeper than just, uh, you know, the key metrics around the volume of people and why they do things. We want to really understand the psyche of the subscriber. What is it that we, um, um, uh, what are the things that we really think about as we go through different stages of the customer journey? What happens when we sign up and, you know, we start using the service? What happens when we, um, you know, potentially use the service some more. And obviously this one is clearly about what happens when we churn. So, you know, in the first one around acquisition, we were talking about, well, you know, the need, the human need for connectedness and freedom. Um, we talked about how brands have 
quite a narcissistic tendency in terms of how they present themselves um, and you know how we felt that you know, brands weren't really taking advantage of you know that dopamine hit the moment when you sign up so yeah we kind of moved on to the second one which was all about once you've signed up how do you uh, you know get the customer using the service potentially more growing the service and you know potentially getting the, in, the, the consumer enjoying the service more so we talked about the child ego state and if you remember that when we have to you know, you know when, when there's money involved we all kind of go back into this child ego state we talked a little bit about you know the idea of a masculine and feminine qualities of the brand and how a lot of ott brands tend to be more masculine as they are uh, feminine and then we we, we 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 discussed the idea of downgrading being a positive um so now we've got through this whole relationship where you know it's almost like the first date all the way through to you know maybe multiple months or years of using the service um, and now we want to divorce we want to leave the service we want to move on and this is really the next stage so um, it's it's typically the final two stages of the customer journey you know when a subscriber wants to leave the service and more importantly actually what can we do when we want to win them back because obviously the whole point is even though we get divorced once we might want to go back and uh, sample the service again so um, this is what this is all about and you know we'll kind of delve into that in a little more detail so one of the things i mentioned at the beginning was that in, in many respects the SVOD service is kind of culpable for many people churning out of the service um talk about how the how the SVOD services are really thinking about their customers and what what the problem is there yeah so i mean when you look at this the SVOD services they tend to think very transactional right in terms of how a customer is interacting. In some ways, you know, they think of you as a number, they think of you of your monthly subscription. Um, they don't really think of you as an emotional human being in terms of um, how I've got to handle you over a period of time. And, you know, like any divorce, um, it's not the last reason that, that actually forces you to leave. It's, you know, it's a build-up over a period of time. And we discovered that build-up starts from the moment you sign up all the way through to this point when you decide to move on. And it really comes down to the idea that um, it's all about give and take, right? It's the idea that, um, you know, if I'm providing money to you, I want to feel valued in return. And that's the critical element towards the overall relationship. How do you get that balance right? Where it's not just about consumers giving money with nothing in return. It's, you know, it's, it, it has to have that balance between the two. And that's one of the key reasons why we as human beings start switching off from these kind of services and consider to, 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 to potentially leave altogether right and so th this might be a good time i think this there's this this concept of balance is balance is captured in this idea of the reciprocity bias and i want to bring jennifer and katarina in here talk to us about that what is the reciprocity bias and how does it play out and, and make people feel so jennifer why don't we start with you well, reciprocity is all about give and take because I guess nobody nobody exists as an island. We all we all need to give and take. Sometimes you know, sometimes you have people who they give so much of themselves they end up feeling depleted. Those are the people who are not engaging in equal reciprocal relationships. And when when you do have a reciprocal relationship that's positive or a reciprocal experience that's positive, it engages the reward centers in the brain which end up making you feel happy, good, you know, relaxed, wanting more of that experience. But what we found with subscribers and brands is that often the subscriber is giving because they're paying, so they're giving every month, but they're not always, sometimes they're getting loads in return and that's great and they're feeling they're getting value for money, but that doesn't tend to be sustained often over a long period of time. There's gonna be downs and there's gonna be times where they feel that they're not getting anything back basically. And that's where brands need to kind of, well, they need to understand first when that's happening and why, but engage with consumers more regularly, consumer subscribers more regularly over time. Right, so. Katerina? Yeah, I think, I think um, it is literally about what you put in, you get out. So if you don't, as a brand, put in a lot of effort, if you don't show a real interest in your customers, what you could show them next rather than you know just the algorithms but really and trying to understand what it is that they like uh, what you could offer them uh, what they would like to watch next um, then you get real engagement back from the customers they can show 
they can see you're interested in them and and then this starts to create loyalty and as jennifer said positive um, feelings within because I'm being recognized as a customer. The brand is showing me um, they have interest in me and really trying to serve me as a customer rather than, oh, thank you very much for your money. And now uh, off you go find the movies um, that you like if you're lucky. So what sort of feelings does that does that generate inside people when when this dynamic is happening? I think they want to share it, don't they? When, when people have a great Kind of exchange with somebody they want to share it you know have you ever been on a really good holiday and come back and said to somebody you should go there it's really good or you've had a really good meal in a restaurant you've told somebody they should go and experience it you know so it has a ripple effect people want to share it when they have a good reciprocal experience and likewise when it's negative they also share that so if there's an exchange that's not quite balanced or they feel they're giving more and getting nothing in return or their bill is too high for something and they've not, you know, your electricity bill is too high, but you've not used any electric, then they're going to complain about that. Is it, is it human nature to com to complain first? I mean, I know I know that uh, particularly in social media, people are very, very ready to complain about a service when it fails them. Right, Katharina, is that that just human nature? Yeah, it is, um, because the brain just gives more attention to negativity than it does to positivity. Um, this is coming from our evolution. That's our survival mechanism, if you like. So that's why everything that is negative, if it's in the media or, you know, we give never negative feedback on a negative experience. That's why we are more prone to that. Um, that's why brands need to really focus on. Uh, get, getting rid of the negative experience and putting much more attention to negative experiences because the brain, their customer's brain, give more attention to that rather than trying to, you know, create positive experience, which is great too, but they don't count as much as getting rid of negative. Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly true to me. I'm always ready to run to social media when uh, one of the services I'm using, <laughs> using fails me. Um, okay, so I've got, I think I understand the reciprocity bias, um, this give and take idea. I certainly see it in, in the services that I use. I, some services are very good at this. Some services are clearly not very good at this. Um, let's talk about when we actually get to the stage where we're going to leave. Uh, so, Bavesh, um, so, so walk us through here. There's this, we've got this, I'll put this diagram up in just a second. There's very specific feelings um, going on in this lead process that people have that brands misperceive, right? So um, talk us through that and I'll pop this, uh, I'll pop this picture up while you're, while you're talking. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there are a number of reasons why we decide to leave a service. Um, that could be everything from you know, probably one of the biggest is we're just dissatisfied with the service. We know that if you have a negative because we've just described, it's going to force or prompt the need to change. And, you know, that, you know, you're already dissatisfied. And one of the ways the brand responds is it makes it incredibly difficult for you to leave. So that's, you know, completely counterintuitive in terms of well, certainly counterproductive, because all that happens is the consumer gets even more frustrated and all they want to do is move on and, 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 and then make that decision. Um, you know, when you uh, potentially thinking about the service and thinking, well, I haven't really used it very much recently. I think it doesn't really merit the subscription service, and particularly right now in the current climates we're in, when we're all looking at our share of wallet and trying to see how we can save money as the, in the, as the world is changing around us. And the flip side is at that point is the brand is trying to interrogate you as to the reasons why you are wanting to go. So there are a number of way, a well, number of reasons why, whether it's financial difficulties or there's a life change or you know broadcasting rights or particular piece of content has moved on somewhere else. But in most cases, it, you know, the brands tend to or tend to react to those in the polar opposite way, which you know certainly drives that anxiety and that annoyance in terms of how we feel as consumers. Very good. And yeah, there's the the the, the fine financial difficulties as well that people get into. 
Yeah. Um, brands, what do they do? What do they do? I mean, I, I must admit, I, when I quit, I have almost never had an escort brand come back with a better offer or some, some something creative to, to help help me stay. You know, it's really, it's really interesting because, you know, sometimes um, it's, you know, to be fair on the brand, there's a balance in act here as well, because to, uh, you know, when you look at the research, consumers, some consumers want you to make them an offer and others don't. So it's almost like knowing when's the right time to make an offer or to try and um, entice the customer to remain. But in, you know, in most cases, it's easier because we all know we will dip in and dip out of these kinds of services it's easier really to make it as simple as possible to leave. And if you do that, then you're gonna create a lot more positive reinforcement for potentially trying to win that customer back in the future. And it seems like there are some things that brands really just can't help, like a sports broadcaster that loses the rights, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some things that you just can't, you know, you know that are out of your control, right? Uh, for example, we've just seen it with COVID, right? So in the UK, probably the same in, in other parts of the world where in particular with sports, that, you know, there was no live sports for a period of time. Um, there's not a lot you can do to that, but you can react. And, and the way you react to that in terms of the leaving service kind of makes or breaks your brand's future and, and ability for a customer to remain loyal with you. So we saw you know, some sporting um, uh, broadcasters, um, OTT services, as well as pay TV that were very much on the front foot and paused subscriptions for their customers, others didn't. And that certainly causes um, anxiety amongst the customer base. So even if you do lose something, or you do lose the rights, or you know that your favorite TV show has disappeared, then actually the way you react to that as a brand, conversely has a better effect if you react to it in the right way. Right, and I guess the final one, this life change issue i mean we've all been through that i think in the last few months and i know that there were some brands some services that really behaved i thought extremely well um sling tv for example stepped up with lots of free services um and several other several other um brands as well did that but many others i won't name names but many others did absolutely nothing yeah and that's certainly you know when when you're in a I guess a depressed situation that we are in right now, then the brands that really step up are the ones that you will remember once you know we get, get back to some degree of normality. So we will remember the brands that didn't look after us, whereas the brands that did, our loyalty will increase. So you know this whole idea of we don't really care whether you come or go, you're just a number, is the impression you get as a consumer when you're trying to leave a service when you have a life change or a moment where you know your circumstances have changed and that doesn't really feel as a consumer that the brand's thinking about you as an individual and how you can how they can help you through the process that you're going through very good okay so let, let's talk about um uh, excuse me let's talk about this decision you've decided to leave um if if you're not dealing with the lever properly um this can be create very negative feelings towards the brand can't it Jennifer? Well yeah and I, th I think I think one of the main problems uh, and we, I guess we started talking about it already is that the brand sees the leaving or the churn as final it's kind of um, it's like a relationship that you're clinging to and then it's over and that's it and that's the end and um, and therefore brands kind of react in quite a clingy way sometimes by kind of bargaining with uh, subscribers and trying to get them to stay and not really understanding their reasons for leaving. And sometimes, as, as Bavesh said, sometimes they can be persuaded and sometimes they're even being a bit manipulative and calling up to threaten to leave because they want a better deal, which isn't great, but that's what some people do. But the majority of the time they actually want to leave for one of those reasons we just saw. And the, the brand, in seeing this as, as some kind of final ending, tends to create negative feeling because they're not making it easy. And therefore, I either feel bad or I feel stressed or I feel nervous or anxious or something like that because I've had to cancel the service and I've been, it's not been made easy, basically, whether that's online or, or, or on the phone, it, it depends. But I, I guess what would be better is calmly going through the reasons that this person is leaving 
finding out, you know, what, what they want from the service in the future or what they could want, you know, what, what went wrong, basically, or, or what's the reason, because it might be that nothing went wrong. And then classifying them in such a way that almost like a post customer segmentation or something like that, where, where you have sections of customers that you can then target in different ways in the future if they agree to, to, be, um, to stay on some kind of database. Or, or even just kind of, if you learn that you're doing something wrong or that a lot of people are reason, leaving for the same reason, then you start to change that. So it's a bit, this is a bit like going back to the relationship analogy. It's a bit like um, you split up with somebody and they beg to get you back and they're begging and they're begging and they're at your doorstep and they're becoming a bit of a stalker. Well, nobody wants to go back to that. But if you see that person on the street a year later looking amazing, then it's a lot more appealing to go back. So in that sense, they don't even have to approach you. They just change because they've listened and they've made those changes in the person. They're now attracting more people to them. Yeah. I can say that um, in my experience, I've left, I, I will not name the service. I left a service and it was very, very unpleasant. They made it very unpleasant to me. And this was 15 years ago. And I have never gone back. Am I just vindictive, Katerina, or is this uh, is this a common a common feeling, a common th thread for people? No, that, that's why it, it almost links to your previous question with the negativity. Because when we are experiencing something highly emotional, positive or negative, and when an experience in the customer journey ends on a negative, that is what usually is remembered the most. Sometimes it's what happens in the beginning and sometimes very little in the, in the middle. So it's very crucial on how brands are behaving when a customer wants to leave and to end on a positive note, because that is what will be remembered. That's why you are remembering an experience from 15 years ago. Um, and as Jennifer and Bavesh said already, um, see, see them as an easy prospect uh, in the future where you don't need to invest much because when you leave on a positive, when they leave on a positive note, they might come back when life changes again or when the financial situation becomes better again. And then you can, you know, it, it's uh, not a lot of money investment. You easily have them back. And um, then it's a matter of how you treat them when they come back. So it's very important to really take care of that fi final uh, stage with a customer so you are remembered well and they talk in a positive way to others about that experience or maybe maybe it's almost like um if if you make it as easy as easy as possible there isn't a chance for people to develop a negative feeling uh, to to leave you with a negative feeling because to be honest i've left many services the ones i remember are the ones that were really bad right so is that is that part of this bias towards the bad experience it's uh it's the negativity bias so it's yeah. just another bias that we have but yeah we we do remember and we do pay more attention to a negative negativity negative experience etc so um, that's why it's crucial to n not, not steer that and when brands act in the way you described in, in the diagram as well that, that's the characteristic of the narcissist, right? It's again just about them. It's just about them wanting the money and just thinking about their own brand and not trying to put themselves into the shoes of the customer, really understanding um, and, and not treating it as a relationship, but as Pavesh said in the beginning, transactional. It's almost like cancelling, withdrawing the payment is is your last stand, your last statement to this to this company, right, Jennifer? Yeah, and, and we have people openly saying that kind of thing, you know, that this is the only thing I could do, this is the only action I could take because I was so angry that I left. But even then, people sometimes don't feel that it's enough. And I guess that's where, going back to your point earlier about social media, that's where people take to social media if they have really bad experiences. And just, 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 um, just something to add on the ending process. It's not just about making and uh, leaving easy by pressing a button to cancel. It's, it's making everything around that transparent as well. So imagine you could press a button to cancel your service, but you get a message to say, okay, you've cancelled, um, 
you'll receive the service until this date, uh, you're paid up until that. You know, it's those kind of things, questions people have got as well, which is, I guess, why people get on the phone a lot instead of just doing it online. Yeah, yeah. And that actually transitions us very nicely into our uh, next topic, which is the win back. Um, so, Babesh, I want to start with you about, about what are some of the good practices? So a customer's decided to leave, they've cancelled. What are some of the good practices that you see out there that people are using to um, improve the chance that they'll win somebody back? Well, I would say, first of all, that it's one of the forgotten moments, really. I mean, we talk about decision moments and stages of a customer journey. Win back is one that um, a lot of operators don't even think about. You know, the customer has disappeared, it's gone, it's gone out of their mind, out of their psyche. Um, they're never going to come back or if they come back, that's fine. But th there's no, um, I'd say th there isn't a consistent way that I've seen with the, um, you know, the customers that we work with that really talk about, let's target um, these win back customers. How do we actually work with win back in terms of, you know, because they've, you know, most of these customers have tried your service before. So if we can kind of tap into that, there's definitely reasons why they would potentially want to come back, especially the ones who had life changes or financial issues. Um, you know, so the things, you know, simple things like, um, you know, still being very personalized when you engage. If you have the ability and, you know, you still have the ability to speak to them, you know, based on regulations and so forth, but if you do, then you can certainly communicate to the customer um, or to the ex-customer and say, oh, by the way, you were watching so-and-so or your favorite football team or whatever is now playing again. Do you want to come back on? So there's different ways to tell. It's, I guess it's the same as everything else. If you're going to be very um, vanilla with the way you communicate, you're going to get a very vanilla response. If you start thinking about personalizing the way you engage with your subscriber, uh, existing as well as post, then you have a better chance of actually getting that customer to come back on again. I had a, the CEO of Sling tell me one time that he didn't think of cancelled customers as cancelled, as not customers. He thought of them as customers that just weren't paying him at mm. that time. Is that the right main? Is the right that the right mindset? I, I certainly think so. I think that's definitely the right mindset. I think they're still customers of yours. You know, they they use your services, particularly with OTT. We know this that. You know, consumers, and we, and we all do it. We dip in and dip out of services as, you know, as and when we want to, particularly depending on the content that we're watching. So, you know, for a brand, and that's you know that 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 uh, behavior is just going to get you know stronger and stronger as more and more brands enter the this type of market. So, the idea that they're still customers and it's your job as a brand to try and help encourage them to come back, then I think that's a very positive stance. And as we talked about before, most think of you as gone as gone. You know, they you know they kind of label you as dormant or lapsed or churned as opposed to, you know, these guys are customers and we could potentially win them back and start getting the pain again. So I, I want to throw out a question a quick question that Richard Reisman has asked and um, I, I think it's a really good one. He I've wondered this as well, Richard. Are are any brands considering only what I eat subscriptions that eliminate the all or nothing model? that requires churn. This is, I, I've often wondered why, but, uh, do you know any services that are considering this? Do you think they should consider th this, Pavesh? Well, I think it comes down to um, the type of service you are and the brand that you're trying to put, portray, right? And, and, uh, and, and to a certain, certain degree, the customer base. Um, we've seen services, um, and you've seen more and more of those. And certainly in the UK, there's a, you know, I can think of one, which is BT Sport and BT who have, um, try to put the control completely at the customer end so you can go in every month and switch on and off exactly what you want to watch. So that to a certain degree is heading in that direction, even though you're still signed up to a, in a multi-year contract. But, you know, I think that's the, um, the approach. The approach should be in giving that control back to the consumer. And by doing so, you will get that longer term loyalty. So I agree. I think it's the, it's the right approach. Very good. So, um, there are some risks, though, when people come back, right, Jennifer? Well, I guess the risk mainly is being the same as before and therefore leading to the same kind of breakdown in the relationship as before. So the risk really is not knowing the subscriber. It's not using that time to really get to know them. 
and to make changes in terms of what's put in front of them. Um, it's a bit like being kind of old talk and no action, you know, come back and we're amazing and, and that narcissistic thing again, but, you know, not really changing anything at the end of the day. So that, that's the main big danger that they, they churn again. And one of the things kind of adding on to what Bavesh said was, is about kind of this idea of being able to freeze um, a subscription. You know, it's often looked at negatively, just being able to stop paying for a while and then come back to it and all your details are saved. I think it's often seen that, that that's a bad thing because, you know, no payments coming in, but actually that maintains the connection with the brand, that maintains the relationship and it means that the brand knows you when you come back. So it's a bit like, you know, I go to my dentist once a year, but he knows my name and he knows my teeth, you know, so which is, you know, expected or your optician or whatever. You know, you, you want the person to, or the brand to know you really because it makes things easier and it makes the relationship more, more effective. You get more out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Katerina, I must admit that there are some times I've gone back to a relationship or even a service and, um, you know, there was a, an initial rush of, oh, it's great to be back. But then all of those bad feelings started up again. Uh, very common, right? Well, that's what um, I guess what uh, Jennifer was alluding to. It's if, if the brand doesn't learn, if the brand doesn't see what it has done, why the customer left, uh, going back to really identifying why they're leaving, the reasons for it in order to then save that information. And then um, when a customer comes back to to try not to do the same mistakes, if, if the brand has behaved in a certain way and that was the reason why the customer left. So um, I think it's all about not being so narcissistic and not thinking, oh, we are so great, so great, but brands do make mistakes and they need to identify what these are um, and then ideally change um, in order for a returning customer to stay then with them. Very good. And I want to, you know, Judy Havers has, has given a great question. She asks, and I, to some extent, I agree with her. She says this discussion so far points, points to some obvious logical behaviors for brands to take into consideration return why is it that more brands don't <laughs> don't pay attention she says these are simple findings and i think that was one of the things that as i read the read the white papers i just didn't think i wasn't thinking in that way about my customers or the customers and the services so why don't brands do something about this narcissists never go into therapy I've said this before <laughs> because they don't want to change. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that's sure the reason. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to a certain degree, it's also because of the changes happening within the industry, right? So when you think about uh, disrupted um, industries over the you know, last couple of decades, you see e commerce, say banking, retail, all of these industries have been through that cycle where you've had to change and we've seen you know, huge number of, you know, household brands that disappeared because they just weren't able to react or change quickly enough to what was going on around them. Um, and to a certain degree, that's what's happening here in this environment, in this, um, in this pay TV broadcast OTT environment where, you know, the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime and these, you know, um, uh, new services are completely disrupting the status quo, as they say, which means that, you know, I'm pretty convinced that the same thing is going to happen in broadcast. We're going to see uh, brands that we have loved and grown up with will just disappear um, over the next um, decade or so because they're just not able to react quickly enough to what's happening. So while they are very simple things to do, um, you know, a lot of brands don't we really, certainly broadcast brands don't we really think of it that way because they've never had to. They've mm -hmm. never had to build a direct relationship with a customer before. And now they do. So they've got to figure that out and figure it out very quickly because there are companies who are brought up by thinking about customers who are the successful ones in this industry. So I think it's, um, there's going to be winners and losers as always in these industries and things change. Um, and you know, the, the other thing that needs to, to a certain degree change is brands should stop thinking just about content. That's the, I guess, the big thing they think about because I've got content, customers going to come in and going to stay. And, you know, everybody has content now, so you've got to think slightly differently 
Um, so these are all very simple ideas that have been put in place in other industries. So I think our industry has to um, start taking note. It's hard to change, right, Katharina? Yeah, it is. And, and I think, um, as Bavesh um, said uh, in a different way already, I think when brands are overconfident, and you know that's also true in, in, for people in relationships, that's their death. It ultimately is. Um, they need to stay open, they need to stay flexible and not uh, so self-centered. And yeah, then yeah. they are allowed to, to cope. I think there's a. I think that that's that's absolutely true, and I I really think that what Bavesh is saying is big element of of the fact that we have old content providers, quote old content providers who just aren't used to listening in this way, mm -hmm. uh, and they they I think that's possibly one of the reasons that they really struggle here. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go into a little bit of a conclusion. I'm gonna ask you guys a little bit of a different question, and I'm gonna also ask the audience, uh, particularly if you've been if you've watched all three of these sessions, but even if you've only watched today, I want to hear what you heard today. What were your big takeaways today? And I'm gonna ask each of the panelists what their big takeaways were from today and and from the whole session. So why don't we start with you, Babesh? So I think, you know, um, when we first did this research, you know, I'm not a psychologist, you know, it's, it's very interesting to, to kind of, when you read it and you start reading the, what's happening, you can put yourself in those shoes. You can say, well, actually, I react that way. I, I figure it this way. So I found that fascinating how we can start, you know, delving into the way we think. So there are a couple of things that really struck out for me. I mean, first of all, the whole premise of the service and the relationship we have with the service you know, it falls down to the fact that we as human beings want to be feel connected as well as being free. And I found that fascinating, that whole balance between providing a service that allows you to be free, but also allows you to feel connected was a really interesting idea. And I just love the idea of um, brands being narcissists, if I'm honest, when you really step back and you think, actually, yes, it's true. And probably not just in this industry, but brands tend to operate in this kind of look how amazing I am. And, um, you know, when you look at other brands that are successful, you can see there's a slight change in the way they react. So I thought that was um, a bit of a jarring moment. They thought, wow, yes, actually that's true. Yeah, yeah, it, it was for me, this is, I mean, I think it's easy to forget the way particularly pay TV broadcasters, pay TV um, uh, companies thought about their customers was that they were their customers they had no choice. They made it very difficult to leave. They locked you into long contracts. And this is just really difficult, I think, for companies, particularly older companies, to absorb mm. that people got to feel free and they, they've got to be able to leave easily if you want to keep them at all and have them come back. Uh, Jennifer, what are some of the things that you uh, you you learned from this session? Oh, before we do, sorry, before, um, could we just pop the, the um, poll up, please, Laura? for today. So while you're listening to us pontificating and thinking about what your big takeaways, there's the poll. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer, sorry. Yeah, I think one thing actually we didn't talk about much today, but one thing that I really noticed from the research was the level of anger that people feel and annoyance when brands prioritize new customers over loyal customers, you know, like being in a marriage and kind of running off with somebody else, basically. It's, it's, it really triggers a lot of, of, of kind of discomfort in subscribers and they, they, like we said before, they want to be noticed for being loyal, they want some kind of reciprocity in the relationship, they don't want to see the brand always going after new customers, so it's about reprioritizing and I think that's something, going back to that question that was asked earlier, that's something that brands don't listen to and don't learn, that they need to kind of reprioritize and put their current customers first. Um, and I think from today, the, the whole thing about an, an ending is not an end. You know, I think that's really important. I think that's a big, um, a big thing to bear in mind, really, that, it, that, it's, that it's not, they're not dead. They're just kind of, uh, not even sleeping, actually. They're wide awake. You know, there's, they're, they're potential customers, really. And yeah. they should be prioritized a bit more. Yeah, I think that issue of new customers getting a better deal than existing customers boy, is that annoying. I mean, it's, it's the way of life, right? With pay television, get to win somebody, you get a great deal. 
But when you're a customer, the great deals go away. Katerina, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's always surprising that um, many brands think in these transactional terms with their customers and and just shifting the mindset of treat it as a relationship, treat it as if you are in a relationship, in a friendship, in a partnership with your customers. How do you want to be treated? How do you want to uh, feel? How do you want to make them feel? Um, and we're all humans. We can all relate to this. This is why we have taken this analogy because everyone can relate to that. Uh, and then if brands have that mindset, um, then it's actually really easy to interact with customers because everyone who's working there is a human themselves. So it shouldn't be that difficult, actually. And I think sometimes what Bavesh was saying as well, look outside of the industry because other industries are a little bit uh, ahead in terms of how to establish really good customer relationships. Um, and learning from other industries and learning who, you know, lost the battle uh, and who's at the forefront. Yeah, I, thank you, Katerina. That's a, that's a great point. Um, and I'm just looking at some of the comments and it's very, uh, very gratifying. Um, uh, Michelle Schott says the subscription business is akin to the hospitality industry. The customer is always right. Ron Nidham says the underlying theme of thinking of the engagement as a relationship and not just a business, business number is a great rubric for how to manage the service model. And uh, I think that's, that's wonderful. It's clear that the pe people in the audience have really understood what you three have had to say, which is wonderful. Um, and let's take a quick look at the, at the poll. So I'm gonna end the poll. And oh, thank you, Laurie. She did that for me. Oh boy, look at this. Do you feel like a valued customer of your favorite? This is your favorite <laughs> service. 52% say no. 15% say that's, uh, that's uh, uh, 67 over two thirds say no or not at all. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing, that's, isn't it? And that's for their favorite service. Goodness knows what it's like for the others. Um, would you recommend your favorite service? Still half would, but that also means that it's very questionable if the, if the other half would at all. And again, this is for a favorite service. I'm, I don't know about you, but that's kind of shocking, right? Yeah. I'm um, kind of wondering as well, do, would they recommend the service or would they recommend it because there's a great series on, so they're actually recommending the series. Yeah, maybe I should have asked that in a slightly different way or, or had a follow-up question Would they recommend the show. Yeah, interesting. Um, have you ever returned to an SVOD service you had previously cancelled? So it looks like uh, pretty much half of the audience has and half haven't, um, which I think is about, that's about where I would have expected it. I know I've gone back to services I've cancelled. And have you ever received an email or text from a service you previously canceled? Let's see. Um, almost half say no. Almost half. Um, but it looks like most people didn't come back, even when they did, which is probably people are not doing a very good job <laughs> at, uh, at following up with people. So... Anyway, I'm going to stop the share now. Thank you all for your input. And um, I want to just say, Bavesh, Jennifer and Katerina, this has been a fascinating series. Thank you so much for joining me here on Let's Do Lunch, Business of Streaming. And uh, boy, I can't wait for the next fascinating set of research that you guys bring out and bring to us here. So thank you, all three of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ned, back to you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, we really enjoyed this uh, this segment, everybody. Uh, thanks again. Um, yeah, as, as I said at the outset, um, this is our last uh, business of streaming webinar for 2020, and we will be back in 2021. But there is still additional content that we will be putting out between here now and the end of the year, in particular. Future of Television will be on November 10th, 11th, and 12th. And our, our favorite moderator, Colin Dix, will be moderating a panel on the 11th. 
uh, which is our day that's focusing on streaming. So make sure to check that out. It's televisionconference.com. Also tomorrow is our uh, final Future of Entertainment webinar. And we have Michael Medrano, who's Vice President of Marketing at Servios. And he'll be in conversation with David Bloom from Forbes uh, about the future of virtual reality and augmented reality. So join us then. And Ned, before, before we drop off, um, I just want to say that all three of these, uh, these uh, psychology of the subscriber uh, are available on the YouTube channel for Digital Media Wire or at the Let's Do Lunch uh, um, uh, website. And you can also pick up all three of the white papers which were produced um, for this, which are the basis for this series from the Singular Decisions website. And I think that Helen has already popped that in into the chat. So feel free to grab those, those are free. And uh, I think you'll enjoy, you'll find them fascinating reading. Anyway, Fantastic. Ned, that's it, back to you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.